Salinity is an important water quality parameter for rivers and lakes, but you might not know much about it. Here I'm going to provide an introduction to salinity in reference to inland waters, because oceans already get enough attention. Before jumping into what salinity is, why does salinity matter to inland waters? Well, for one, salinity affects water density. As salinity increases, density increases. In many lakes, density differences in the water column will cause the lake to stratify for extended periods of time. This density and post stratification in freshwater lakes is often driven by temperature differences and it's a barrier to full lake mixing. But high salt concentrations will also stabilize lake water columns because saline water is denser than freshwater. The accumulation of salts in a lake can increase density gradients in the water column and lead to delayed, diminished, or disrupted lake mixing. At the extreme end of the spectrum, a lake can become meromictic, where a layer of salty bottom water can't mix with the fresh water above it. Oceanographers traditionally have studied salinity to a much greater extent than limnologists, because along with temperature, salinity drives ocean circulation, which influences our planet's climate. Unlike the oceans, which actually have a pretty narrow range of salinity, you can find inland waters that range from almost pure water to water with 10 times the salinity of the ocean. The wide range of salinity that we see in inland waters influences biology because most species are only adapted to live in a very narrow range of salinity. Salinity can be used as an indicator of what species might be living in a lake. This becomes front and center when thinking about invasive species in suitable habitats. Take for instance zebra mussels, an invasive species in North America. Zebra mussels have colonized many lakes, impacting both infrastructure and food webs. As it turns out, zebra mussels need calcium to build their shells, so they don't tend to grow in lakes that have calcium concentrations less than about 17 milligrams per liter. So if you're a natural resource manager charged with preventing the spread of zebra mussels, you can look at salinity to tell you about potential habitats and where to focus your effort and money. In general, aquatic organisms have evolved to deal with the salinity in their environment, and the vast majority do poorly if the salinity changes. In excess, salt is toxic to freshwater organisms. Freshwater organisms are osmoregulators, who maintain concentrations of molecules within their bodies at higher concentrations than the external environment. This is achieved through a variety of mechanisms, such as actively transporting ions against concentration gradients or regulating water loss through osmoregulatory organs such as kidneys. If environmental salinity increases, organisms must use energy to maintain osmotic balance, which can result in less energy for things like reproduction and growth. As salinity rises, osmotic stress can impair physiological function and result in death. Concentrations at which salinity becomes toxic to freshwater plants, animals, and microbes is species specific. Generally, larger vertebrates, like fish, are more tolerant than invertebrates. We need to define salinity. When we use the term salinity as a water quality parameter, we are referring to the mass of dissolved inorganic solids found in water. Owing to the power of water as a solvent, salinity comprises numerous ions and molecules, but for most limnological purposes, Salinity is considered the mass concentration of the major cations, so calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium, major anions, chloride and sulfate, and carbonate species, bicarbonate and carbonate, that are all dissolved in water. The cations have a positive charge, and they're found on the left side of the periodic table of elements. The anions have a negative charge and are found on the right. One way of remembering this is that cations have a positive charge, while anions are a negative ion. When high precision measurement of salinity is required, other ions should be taken into account. These include the small fraction of mass contributed by silica, notably inert, minor ions like iron, manganese, aluminum, fluorine, 
and nutrients like nitrate and phosphate. These all might be important. Salinity is often considered interchangeable with total dissolved solids, or TDS. But TDS includes the mass of dissolved organic matter. This subtle difference is often insignificant, but becomes important where DOM concentrations are high, as dissolved organic matter can affect density. Because there are many different ions in water, comprehensively measuring the complex mixture of constituents in water is a massive undertaking. Measuring ion concentration often involves expensive analytical equipment such as the ion chromatograph shown here. Therefore, it's useful if there is a way to approximate salinity using a simpler method than measuring and adding up all of the specific ions. Because salinity is dominated by ionic constituents that are positively and negatively charged, salinity can be approximated by the electrical conductivity, or EC. This is a measure of a solution's ability to conduct electrical flow. By definition, electrical conductivity is the reciprocal of the resistance of a solution measured between two electrodes that are one centimeter square in area and one centimeter apart. In fresh to saline waters, electron flow increases with increasing ion content. Hence, the saltier the water is, the higher the EC. EC is expressed in micro or millisiemens per centimeter. Many lakes are less than 100 microsiemens per centimeter, compared to the ocean, which is 50,000 microsiemens per centimeter. EC is also highly temperature dependent. Temperature increases from 0 to 30 degrees Celsius both decrease water viscosity and increase the solubility of most salts, thereby increasing EC by about 1.9% per degree Celsius. Therefore, instead of reporting raw EC values, EC is actually corrected to a specific temperature, in many cases 25 degrees Celsius, and then reported as specific conductance. The beauty of electrical conductivity and the corrected version specific conductance is that you can measure it in the field easily using a handheld probe. Here's a photograph of a conductivity meter showing the specific conductance of Lake Mendota is 505 microsiemens per centimeter. The relationship between salinity and EC is dependent on the relative proportion of dissolved ions, as ions are not equal in their influence on conductance, and therefore the relationship of EC to salinity is site-specific and only holds for a constant relative ratio of dissolved ions. So EC salinity relationships can be devised for inland waters where the proportions of the individual ions are relatively constant. This graph and table show the relationship between salinity, specific conductance, and ion concentrations derived from Swedish lakes. Now overall, limnologists rarely have the luxury of working in a homogeneous setting and must be cognizant that the relative proportions of dissolved ions are typically in flux, in flux. For minor constituents of lake water, like nitrogen, iron, manganese, or phosphorus, a large change in the relative concentration may have an indistinguishable effect on specific conductance. So whether or not to report electrical conductivity, specific conductance, salinity, or TDS, will depend upon the application, and a detailed description of the methods used to calculate these values should always be given. Now, the beauty of inland waters is in their diversity, and salinity is no exceptions. Lakes range in salinity from almost pure water, like glacially fed lakes, to saline lakes like the one shown here. Take Don Juan Pond in Antarctica, shown in the lower right panel of this figure. With a salinity level of over 40%, Don Juan Pond is significantly saltier than most of the other hypersaline lakes around the world, and more than 10 times saltier than the ocean. Don Juan, Don Juan Pond's waters are so saturated with salt that it doesn't fully freeze unless the temperature drops below minus 50 degrees Celsius. 
Given the natural gradient of salinities in inland waters, it's useful to differentiate fresh water from saline water, even though there's no ecological basis for such an exact threshold and opinions on that terminology have varied through time. Nevertheless, for practical purposes, the boundary between fresh and saline water has been generally accepted as one to three grams per liter. For some applications, more regionally meaningful thresholds might be more appropriate, and suggestions have included 0.5 or 5 grams per liter. Freshwater for drinking purposes is often restricted to less than 0.5 grams per liter for aesthetic effects. Lakes with salinities greater than 3 grams per liter are referred to as subsaline or just saline lakes. The water in saline lakes is referred to as brine, meaning a salty solution. And notably, many of the largest lakes on Earth are saline, including the Caspian Sea, Lake Van, Lake Turkana. But the majority of the hundreds of millions of lakes on Earth are freshwater lakes. In the history of limnology, many different classification systems have been proposed for saline lakes with varying terminology. This figure from Hammer shows the agreement and disagreement between saline lake nomenclature. The ionic composition of freshwaters is dominated by dilute solutions, solutions of alkalis and alkaline earth compounds, particularly by carbonates, carbonates, sulfates, and chlorides. And as stated earlier, the concentration of four major cations, calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium, and four major anions, bicarbonate, carbonate, sulfate, and chloride, usually constitute the total salinity of water for all practical purposes. Major ion composition of inland waters is commonly expressed in mass concentrations, so milligrams per liter or micrograms per liter, or in molar units. Because the conversion between mass and molar units changes the ionic ratios, the choice of units must be clearly stated. The concentration of an individual ion in a lake might be referred to as high versus low. For example, a limnologist might say, so-and-so lake has a lot of sulfate. However, knowing what is high versus low only comes with experience. Whether a lake has a lot or very few ions comes from knowing the range of salinities and ion concentrations in inland waters both globally and regionally. The most comprehensive estimate of the global mean salinity of river water is 128 milligrams per liter, based on 1,200 pristine and subpristine basins. This impressive data set, assembled by Maybeck, shows the range of salinities across the world's major river basins. A similar bait database does not exist for global lakes, but in a randomly stratified sampling of U.S. rivers and lakes by the United States EPA, mean specific conductance in over 2,200 rivers was 629 microsiemens per centimeter, and in 1,230 lakes, it was 688 microsiemens per centimeter. And over large regions of the temperate zone, the dissolved composition of rivers and lakes is dominated by bicarbonate and calcium, followed by sulfate and magnesium and sodium. Unlike rivers, lakes can also be saline and hypersaline. These are mostly lakes that are closed basin where water can't flow out. Some of the saline lakes in North America have very high salinity content and are much more saline than the open ocean. But again, most of the millions of lakes on Earth are freshwater. This leads to the question, where are all the ions coming from? The salinity of inland waters depends on watershed drainage and exchange from the surrounding land and groundwater, atmospheric sources, and human activity. And in lakes, more so than in rivers, salinity is further influenced by evaporation, biotic and abiotic losses from the water column, and equilibrium and exchange with the sediments. In addition, there are many coastal lakes and ponds of marine origin where ionic composition has evolved from trapped seawater. 
Ultimately, ions are derived from rocks. The composition of soil and rock and their ion exchange capacities influence both rates of weathering and ion supply to runoff in groundwater. Weathering causes rocks to break down and water transports the material downhill towards rivers and lakes. Different rocks release different ions and the rate of weathering depends on climate. Here's an example of how chemical weathering leads to ion delivery in fresh waters. Example one is a hydrolysis reaction of orthoclase, a common mineral in igneous rock. This yields salicylic acid and potassium ions, which could then be delivered to a nearby river or stream. Example two, carbonic acid dissolves calcite, a common mineral in sedimentary rock. This yields calcium and bicarbonate ions. The importance of carbonic acid in weathering is evidenced by the high proportion of bicarbonate ions in most river waters. Here's an example of chemical weathering reactions across two major bedrock types in the state of Wisconsin. In the north, quartzite yields silica atoms. This igneous rock weathering is very slow and leads to dilute waters. Dolomite, on the other hand, is a sedimentary rock, which weathers more quickly and produces ion-rich water and the delivery of calcium, magnesium, and bicarbonate atoms. Atmospheric deposition can be a significant source of salinity for many dilute freshwaters and also for some saline lakes. The delivery of ions from the atmosphere to watersheds is largely through wet deposition. So the washing out of atmospheric gases or aerosols by rain, snow, or fog. In arid regions, dry depositional salts, so the direct fallout in the absence of precipitation, can occur in significant quantities. All of the major anions in natural waters are cycled in part through the atmosphere as gases, as well as in dissolved and particulate form. The traditional suite of ions measured in rain is slightly different from those measured in surface waters because of the low salinity and low pH of rain Hydrogen ions and nitrogen species, like ammonia and nitrate, can account for an appreciable percent of total salinity in rainwater. And variation in atmospheric loading to surface waters is significant. Globally, most precipitation has a salinity less than 3 mg per liter, but higher salinities, up to 30 mg per liter, are found near the coast and downwind of industrial pollution. And the ocean's a major source of atmospheric sodium, chloride, magnesium, and sulfate. These all originated from rock weathering. And atmospheric salinity can be carried for great distances, although most atmospheric salinity is precipitated with rainfall in the coastal regions. The effects of atmospheric transport of ions can be seen in lakes enriched with sodium and chloride in coastal maritime regions. Windblown dust from soils also contributes salts, especially calcium and potassium to surface waters. Wind transported salts from salt pans in arid regions such as in Russia, Western Australia, or the United States can be moved large distances to rivers and lake systems. Now the exploitation of geological resources for human use has contributed to atmospheric deposition of ions to surface waters. A notable point source pollutant that quickly became globally pervasive was the industrial emission of sulfur and nitrogen compounds from the burning of fossil fuels by power plants. Sulfuric and nitric acids in the atmosphere led to the widespread acidification of aquatic ecosystems, particularly in Northeast North America and also in Scandinavia. The devastation of acid rain on the chemistry of surface waters in the 1960s through 80s led to global action to curtail its effects. And since the 1980s, surface and nitrate deposition have decreased in North America thanks to policy actions by multiple countries. So 50 years later, it's looked upon as an environmental policy success and many lakes have recovered or are well on their way to recovery. However, aquatic ecosystems are still at risk of atmospheric pollutants especially in industrializing countries such as China, where atmospheric deposition of sulfur is still high. 
Humans also introduce ions to rivers and lakes through direct watershed inputs. Point source pollutants include industrial outflows, wastewater effluents that contain water softener brine, and mining waste. Non-point source pollutants in major ions are equally prevalent. Common agricultural fertilizers include potash, commonly potassium chloride, and sulfur additions. And livestock manure applied to farmland can similarly contribute ions. In many cold regions, road de-icing salts applied to impervious surfaces are a leading cause of salinization. The omnipresence of salt pollution from human activities leaves many freshwater resources vulnerable. In the United States, upwards of 50 to 60 million tons of sodium chloride are consumed annually, almost half of which, so over 20 million tons, is used as road de-icer. So sodium chloride is applied to roads and other paved surfaces to reduce or prevent the buildup of ice by lowering the freezing point of water, thereby creating safer conditions for vehicles and pedestrians. And the use of road salt in North America started in the 1940s and has steadily increased through the decades as the road network has grown. The problem is the entirety of road de-icing salt is released into the environment, moving directly through storm sewers or gradually percolating through soils, and it's known to be the leading cause of widespread salinization of freshwater lakes, rivers, wetlands, and groundwater in regions with heavy road salt use. And in many cities, salinization is exacerbated by point source pollution from water softener and industrial effluent discharged directly to rivers. Human salt pollution is often in the form of chloride salts, so sodium chloride, calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, and therefore human-induced salinization is often tracked by measuring chloride ions. Quantifying the magnitude of chloride pollution requires a knowledge of the background or natural concentrations. For instance, in the three Wisconsin lakes shown in this figure, chloride concentrations in the 1940s were often less than three milligrams per liter. This long-term da data enables us to draw conclusions about the rate and magnitude of salt pollution. In this case, almost entirely the result of road salt runoff. Unfortunately, few data sets extend back past the 1950s, prior to the advent and explosion of road salt use in North America. However, using long-term data of current pristine systems, we can draw the conclusion that the background chloride concentrations in most freshwater lakes, rivers, and wetlands should be less than 10 to 20 milligrams per liter, and in many cases less than 5 milligrams per liter in Central and Eastern North America. So we've covered the sources of ions to inland waters. Through natural and human origins, ions enter lakes directly, say through a pipe, via rivers, and as deposition from the atmosphere. But salinity in lakes is also affected through in-lake processes, such as evaporation, dilution, ice formation, and sedimentation. Climate affects the balance between precipitation and evaporation, and thus the salinity of surface waters. The salinity of lake water is governed not only by the inputs of dissolved ions from runoff, but the fate of these materials upon evaporation. As water evaporates from a lake basin, ions are left behind and become more concentrated, and consequently salinity increases. For shallow lakes, during periods of aridity, these lakes may evaporate completely or sufficiently to expose large expanses of dried salts. Humans are also altering natural salt, concent salt concentrations in inland waters through the diversion and withdrawals of freshwater rivers. Diversions of freshwater river inputs concentrates the remaining lake water. It increases salinity and therefore can drastically change freshwater ecosystems. Conversely, salinity decreases via dilution. Lakes and rivers are diluted by freshwater inputs. Here's a time series of specific conductance in Dorn Creek in Wisconsin showing large downward troughs, so big negative peaks in specific conductance caused by rain events. One of the most curious in-lake processes affecting salinity is the formation of lake ice. When water begins to crystallize into ice, 
Dissolved ions are actually rejected into the surrounding water and not incorporated into the ice lattice. In winter, this can temporarily and sometimes significantly increase ion concentrations and specific conductance in shallow water bodies. Lastly, there's ion removal through other biological and physical processes. For example, dissolved calcium is removed from the water column biologically by organisms using calcium to form calcareous skeletons and other organismal structures. Dissolved calcium is also removed through inorganic precipitation of carbonate materials. Whiting events are a striking phenomenon where calcium carbonate precipitates in the water column, turning lakes a chalky white color. These whiting events are actually known to be triggered by large phytoplankton blooms that rapidly raise the pH of surface water, thereby decreasing calcite solubility. Here's an example from Lake Mendota. The, the top graph shows a decrease in specific conductance in the summer months. We believe this is due to episodes of calcium carbonate precipitation, which are reflected in the lower summer calcium and bicarbonate concentrations. In the satellite image, you can see teal colored water near the top of the lake, which might reflect a whiting event. Some of the calcium carbonate is entrained permanently in the sediments and commonly constitutes more than 30% of sediments by weight in moderately hard water lakes. This is actually another mechanism for carbon burial in lakes. So now you've learned that salinity is not relevant to only the ocean, but in fact is more diverse and complex in inland waters. So to summarize, salinity is the sum of total dissolved solids. We usually calculate salinity by adding up the mass of the four major cations and the four major anions. That said, salinity is hard to measure, so we often measure specific conductance instead. Inland waters range in salinity from near zero to over 400 grams per liter. And salinity impacts lake physics because of density, lake chemistry, and lake biology because of organismal adaptation. Ions are ultimately derived from rock weathering, and humans are changing the salinity of fresh waters. Ultimately, we need fresh water, and understanding salinity is the first step to protecting our freshwater resources.